Sue asks, uh, says he, she bought a painting, which I think she must have been a drawing of da Vinci a few weeks ago. And I noticed that in the image, the Virgin and Child with St. Anne and St. John the Baptist, he was using outline to draw the foot of the lady on my left. Uh, can you please explain to us why? Uh, so I have, my first inclination was to uh, tell you they're totally obvious. I mean, he, he drew an outline of the foot on the left because he wanted to put the foot in there. But I don't mean, I don't want to have you take me as being facetious. Uh, so let's go down and look at that picture. Uh, this on our left is, I mean, on the screen, yeah, on the left of the screen is that, I assume you got that drawing. You mean the drawing, because the drawing has this outlines of a foot down there. And, uh, you know, it appears that he's uh, in the process of designing a picture. The only thing I could find, uh, uh, and it, there may be an actual shot of this, of this very, uh, I'm sorry, an actual painting based on exactly this cartoon, but... Um, I, I kind of think not. Uh, I think it was changed to what you see on the right. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm taking this opportunity, though, even though I, you know, it's obvious that the way he worked was from outlines, Da Vinci was. So when he wanted to put a foot in, he would draw the outline of a foot. And one of the things you could notice is he's using rather loose lines, and then he'll find, he'll improve on those lines. And that's one of those things that a lot of students think they have to get a perfect line or something like that pre-measure and all that and be very careful. And what you really have to do is put down something and look at it. And that's one of the things I like about Da Vinci. In fact, most people, most painters actually historically have done that. They've drawn the look of nature, the, the long line, and then adjusted the long line. You know, I'm talking about the entire line along an edge, for example, or some significant part of it. So, um, and by the way, I, I sort of decided I wasn't gonna be doing these slide things anymore, but I got, I got into this one because I thought it would be worthwhile one time on one of these shows to just talk about the difference again um, between the line based and the Boston School type painting, the visual, visually based or mass based, if you want to put it that way, way of thinking. So I'm showing you the Da Vinci drawings on the, on the left and on the right in this image, in this picture. And you can see, I think you should be able to see quite plainly the um, orientation of, of Da Vinci. I mean, it's, it's, it's exquisitely beautiful outline and all the way around, you know, that sort of thing, and all the way around everything, all the hairs, you know, everything modeled, drawn around and modeled, as it were, from an outline, from a line, right? So all this attention is paid to line. Now, these are line drawings, and you'd expect that, right? They're not mass drawings. They wind up with some mass because they, they have red chalk in them, or they wind up with mass because that's what they did. They would line, they put line in and draw with line, and then uh, slowly mass it and so but it's a line drawing whereas this one in the middle you might argue is a mass drawing but yet, yet you can see that the there's that long flowing line that searched for line and mass and uh, this is of course this is a Benson this is the Boston School approach uh, to this whole thing but um, but the, the difference is huge and I think da Vinci would be pretty excited if he saw this world uh, that you're that you're that we're visiting here I hope you can keep an eye on my arrows. I'll try not to make him move so fast. I noticed on the previous ones I was moving him pretty fast. I am going to go through this relatively fast, though. So, uh, and uh, I think I have this. Uh, I've, I've, I've been uh, sort of in and out of which way to go with this kind of thing. But I took some extremities that I could find uh, from uh, different kinds of painters. And as you can see on the left, you have those the uh, all the images except the middle top one so so let's see if i can find the arrows so this one here is a da vinci but all this stuff here all these here these are velasquez this one here these are all velasquez and this is the way the velasquez would start he wouldn't start from an outline he would start from a mass and an effect okay and uh, and 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 then this is boston school painting it's the same exact thing um where you can plainly see this is a tarbell and these two are are uh, joseph de camp and you can see that they are mass-based and effect-based. And so the outline, so to speak, is exclusively kept in those places like this. And it never is drawn, a finger is not drawn around and then uh, uh, modeled. Not, you, don't, you don't draw around the fingers, then model it up, and then maybe lose something toward the end. That's a little different model. That's, the, that's this other structure. 
Now, in, in the da Vinci model here, plainly, you can see outline dominates and stays dominant. Uh, in other words, you don't want to lose it once you find it, right? Even Degas talks about that very concept. These two are by, uh, by Ang, and, uh, and this is Bougaro. And I, I think of this as the Bougaro realism, right? <laughs> because there's something about this that stops far short of the aesthetics. This is far more just realism just more realistic noodling. And the guy's the master of skin tones, I must say. Bougaro's quite astonishing that way. I'm talking about the, the surface of the skin, feeling like it's tactile, even warm. Uh, beautiful stuff. Anyway, but these are all based, all of these, including the realism of Bougaro, are based on drawing outlines and modeling what's in between the lines. Degas' very definition. These are based on, on masses of value and what happens where these values meet. So uh, we'll, we'll pick up more as we go. But I want you to see this side by side, and I hope it triggers in you a, not a love-hate, but a respect, a mutual respect. I'm trying to show you fundamentally that there are two different ways of painting. And if you want to call the one mass-oriented and the other one line-oriented, you'd be in good company. You'd be, you'd, you, other people have said the same thing. So here again, a, right in the middle is a, um, is a, a, a Joseph de Camp. On the right is an Ang, and, and here on the left is, is um, a Da Vinci. And nothing could be more obvious, right, than that what he's doing is drawing objects. He's drawing literal objects, the outlines of these objects, and then modeling the heck of them, and very beautifully at that. Uh, and he does the same thing. He treats the eye as an object, the nose as an object, and the eye as an object. This is all related very much to why people think, and, and one of those things they'd already concluded was that you, you have to learn anatomy and those sorts of things. So when you're drawing fingers, you can do good fingers. Uh, when you get to the Boston School, it's really far more about effects. And uh, yes, you have to have good anatomy and all the rest of that stuff. But that stuff is, is, is all driven by um, form ideas, contour, you know, uh, silhouette, and, uh, and those various things uh, in combination uh, from the very beginning not outlines, and then noodled all up to the end. So, and the same thing you see with Ang. Ang has this sort of, I'd say, unfortunate tendency to have these elements that he has here, like the hair, look cut out. And in other words, he really is such a good student of the, <laughs> the cutout of the visual. What, he, what he's thinking of as the, as the object unit, that they begin to look more and more like that, or they never look much less like that. There are better, there are examples where he's not quite as, I guess the right word to me would be obnoxious as this, but, um, but you can see if you look closely at these images or find them online, you'll find that he very much has a, uh, an inclination to um, piecemeal. And, uh, and, it's a, and, it be, and, the, and so part of the reason you switch to this way of painting is because uh, you want the relationships of all the elements, and you want to have you want to be bringing everything up at once. Uh, in this outline-based approach, you can't be doing that, uh, not holistically. And I mean all the elements, meaning meaning lost areas coming being put down at the same time as found areas are put down, and 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 areas of um, uh, 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 of objects freely um, um, lost into other areas right from the beginning. So, so now I'm going to show you, see this is, this is their models of the Boston School are, uh, are uh, um, obviously Vermeer and Velasquez. And so I'm showing you this Vermeer side by side, and if you can't see the difference, now it isn't exactly obviously the same light, but one of the attractions of the way of working from the Boston School or, the, or this, this Vermeer idea is the backlight is no object. It's a lot easier to do these kinds of works, in my opinion. I found it to be much easier to do those things in front to three quarters front light. Uh, but that's not necessarily obviously the case. But looking at this, though, you can see that this is done by the drawing of objects, outlines of objects, outlines of objects, outlines, 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 and, and modeling. This thing is done by spots, and that's the best way to describe That's why Hale describes it, painting by the spots. And so you have value units, and you have what happens where this value unit meets that one. You have the size of this one, you have the tilt of it, you have the color and color movements in it, but it's, then you have the visual order of the edges, and pretty soon you've got the eye, but it's never done from the anatomy of eyes, ever, okay? And that is the big difference, okay? So you wind up in this world, though, being able to paint anything. 
you don't have to study eyelids and uh, and know the names of the uh, of the different uh, portions of the eyelids, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and. Um, you don't have to come in close to the model as Gamow had us actually doing and study up, draw with a very careful line all the little folds so you understand the eye. No, in fact, you have to get the visual impression of the eye from the distance you're looking at it. Uh, it with, and as, as this gentleman has done with a, with a wonderful sense of visual order. So uh, these outline-based ones have, eventually these artists are strong enough to get something like visual order, but it isn't the visual order. The, uh, the drama of this impression here would have been very, very difficult for this painter, great as he was. Now, I happen to find this online. Sorry, Rick, uh, it says it's yours. <laughs> On the left side, there's this chunk of a photograph where somebody has actually done a, um, a noodled up version of a model posed as, uh, as uh, the girl with the pearl necklace. I mean, if, and if this isn't, isn't an actual photograph itself, I'm impressed. It doesn't look like it. It looks like it's a painting, but when you look at the Trump version of this, I mean, I, this is hard to believe this is actually painted, but it's, uh, but the graininess of a piece of cloth uh, blows my mind. Uh, and, but, you know, that's, you know, in a sense, neither here nor there. The point is, there's a difference in this way of approaching it. This is much more, this eye, which is coming from, from the left eye, right eye here. This eye is much more along the lines of, of an articulate eye. You know, you focus in on everything. Everything's carefully focused in on simultaneously. And you draw the heck out of the entire area until you have a photographic likeness. And uh, of course, this is the point at which Degas would say, and so now when are you gonna start making a picture? Uh, because you've now just copied nature and what's the point of that again? Uh, so, uh, but backing off again, though, uh, however you approach this, and you can approach that this way, this begins to be one of those questions of how far do you push nature? Do you, did you really need to do that? I love this example of this, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, Vermeer, because it's a, an example of just stunning painting. With, with not this endless amount of, you know, of just a littleness of, of details, you know. I mean, I, I swear there must be, uh, you could, you could you, there could be eye, there could be veins on the eyes in this picture. Uh, uh, and, and uh, I'm not, so, but let's move on. Velasquez is uh, uh, really the um, precursor for most of us. Um, and you can see what he's doing here. Again, I'm showing you an ang down in the, in the corner here. And here's that careful outline, flattened out, careful cut out outline, and modeled up, modeled up, very beautifully studied. I mean, really, everybody should at some points and another be, and you need to be good, flat out good at, at doing silhouette. I mean, you really gotta get good at that. And every place it happens, you should be good at it. But you should be able to do it where it shows up and not feel inclined to have to do the silhouette of the hair. So in the case of a, of, a, of a head like this, you know, you're gonna be doing some drawing here and doing a whole lot of law stuff, and then you'll be doing some drawing here, a whole lot of whatever, and pulling off something here. And so it'll be like that when you're doing visual, you know, when you're doing this visually. Significantly, most of Aang's stuff is front lit, and uh, it sort of uh, allows him to do, frankly, a little bit what we do. If he sets everything up with silhouettes, then that's his job, he's made silhouettes. How well does that work when you don't set it up with silhouettes? So I'm saying, among other things, that the other method, the method of painting by the spots and by the effect and by mass, is a, is a gift to those people who want to paint on unusual lights uh, and, and um, won't burn your eyeballs out, you know, with strain. So, uh, but a nice close-up look at the eyes here and the eyes here will give you again what I'm talking about, what da Vinci was doing, outlines of objects. This, this has turned into the object called the eye. This is actually spots, value, unit, value units, and effects, and it produces huge information, not just about the eye, but about the light, and about so many other things. Um, and it's, but it's not weak in any way in form, it's big in form. It doesn't get down into lots of teeny little forms uh, to, the extent, to the extent that they are needed as, they, you know, as time goes by, as, as they're working this thing out. But, but this is a wonderful example, though, of the other way of working. And this is one by DeCamp, which is another example of someone painting by the mass. 
And so you'd see a mass like this part of the eye. That would have been blobbed in there, right? He would, he would have just set that blob in there. And his job would have been to articulate the, um, the, the and to place it well, to get the color of it well, any movements of color within it well, and to, and to beautifully state its, its tilt, tilt, what we're talking about, the tilt of the mass of this thing. So you want to get its size right to the hole, you want to get its color right to the hole, you want to get, and this is the process, and it's very different from trying to draw an eye, which would have you not just here, but all the way out to here, and doing all this other stuff, which is unrelated, actually. And valuistically unrelated means that you're going to have more difficulties in painting it. Uh, uh, yes, you'll have different kinds of difficulties in painting it. But, uh, and so there's an enormous amount of lost area over, you know, through passages like this. And notice how the eye is made. You'll see that how much is not put in, very much in this model. Uh, and the other way of looking at these things, so much is always put in, everything. No, it's almost like there's no ability to have discretion about how much to put in. So, oops, I went too far. Um, so here's, a, again, in the middle is a DeCamp. I happen to uh, <laughs> think DeCamp is the, is the prime model of uh, this kind of mass painting, effect-based painting, when it comes to the figure and portrait. Uh, and that does not saying anything bad about Tarbell. It's a, it's a terrific portrait painter. And, uh, and Benson is, is good in every way. But, but I wanted to show you a couple of these because they're similar, the, uh, the Leonardo here and the, um, and the DeCamp here. And again, I wanted to, you to see this is the articulation of an eye. This is like knowledge-based you're looking, but you're painting considerably more than you would be able to see from a distance. If you're at the right distance, the Da Vinci would have had you back. So this whole figure, you would have been back about, if this figure was sitting there and she was, say, four feet tall and you're doing the whole figure, uh, you would have been back about 12 feet. And I, I certainly, my eyes can't see all this little stuff at 12 feet. And part of the mercy of this way of painting is that, is that, uh, you only have to paint the amount that's appropriate for the distance you see it at. There's no reason to paint more. It'll be unified in itself at that location. Uh, so it's just an important thought for you to have, to, to be aware of. Um, again, notice the painting by, these are the blobs, the, the blobs, the eye, the mass of the eye. A quote from Hale is an interesting one. He says, he says notice they... Um, uh, uh, we, we were looking at Vermeer, and I think he met him in Paxson, and we, and we looked and we said, wait, look, he's not drawing an eye, he says, put a blob in there. And it was like it was the first time in their life they saw that. And so that was Vermeer, talking about Vermeer. Well, it's the same thing with Velasquez, same thing with Boston School. This is about, ma this is what we, you might call mass painting or tone painting. Um, and so you have a grand mass like this here, and you have a few effects that you're going to be using that you're going to have to draw well, things like this, or passages like that, and so on. And it's so much merciful than, you know, much more merciful than having to draw an entire nose that you can't even see. Uh, and yeah, tell me again, which one of these is a better image, a better likeness of what you see from your distance? Uh, and by the way, without being photographic in this case, right? So... Uh, the, uh, the visual impression is what this is about. This is about really head-based, knowledge-based painting. And uh, even when people are doing as painting from life, you'll find their re the, 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 uh, the curious resorting to, the, to knowledge, uh, which we did under Gamel, by the way, again. So I just wanted to show you this, though, because here's Da Vinci doing a tree, drawing from the outlines the way he does everything else. And, and, and yet, I was looking, I was at a show at the Metropolitan, and there was this little teeny thing, and I mean, it was so teeny, I doubt that it was the size of a postage stamp. And it was, it's, it's a woods, it's the edge of a, of a woods, a copse. And it's painted by the fleck. It's painted just like, just like uh, Velasquez painted these couple landscapes that we have. When he was opening up to the possibilities of painting the impression as opposed to painting the objects. Now, I'm, I, I'm convinced that da Vinci would have been there with us. He, he would have been that guy. And uh, so whatever, for whatever else that, uh, wherever else that takes us, uh, I think that's the story. Oh, there's one more point. And then I'm out of here. Uh, yes, I'm too long. Okay. So um, thank you for the question, Sue. But, uh, and I know this isn't necessarily, but I couldn't figure out exactly where you're going. So I'm just doing this as an opportunity for both of us. So, but this is actually uh, an example of the two different ways of approaching painting. This is painting by the spot. This is a, this is a corner of a painting, a still life portion of a painting by, by uh, 
you might call it the lay-in phase or the earlier phase of a painting by uh, by Joseph de Camp with a woman holding a cup. These are these are kitchen pictures also. They're all as it were kitchen pictures. This is early uh, this is early Velasquez, and you can see what he's doing is literally drawing objects, literally nuding. He was just like Da Vinci. He was just like he was just like Ang. All of them did the same thing, and he's the guy who's woke us up. He's the guy who said that ain't good enough, and, and moved us over in this direction. And finally, now you see clearly the difference. And it isn't like I'm telling you. Some people just call it a sketchy painting. This is an approach to painting. It doesn't do a sketchiness. It's an approach. You can take this. You can take this and push it all the way to as much finesse as you want. But, but in the end of the day, you'll have a, great, greater, a far greater sense of visual order. And you'll be less subject to the photographic, right, to the, to the literalness of the object. So, Sue, thank you very much and, um, and for giving me this opportunity. And I hope you'll subscribe, uh, share, and all the rest, people. And uh, apologies for going real long again.